Hi, and welcome to my talk. Hi, I'm domain slash Steve. Please let me access VLAN 2. It's about tricking firewall user identity capabilities into applying security policies to arbitrary, arbitrary IPs on the network. Uh, my name is Justin Purdock. I'm a pen tester or at Simon Defense. I enjoy drinking craft beers and long morning in my free time. And as you might like imagine, I'm into hacking stuff, but also automating stuff. And if you want everyone to reach me, you can contact me on Twitter. So today we're going to talk about a feature in firewalls that allow me to apply security policies to my IP. Uh, to start off, we're going to talk about an assessment where I initially discovered this is the thing that firewalls do. Um, then we're going to shortly cover how uh, traditional network segmentation is implemented and how the tool is uh, implemented from the vendor. Then we're going to cover how I build a tool that allowed me to respond to these uh, requests and that I was able to pwn two different firewall vendors. Lastly, we're going to close off the talk by speaking uh, about the National Logical Research and some conclusions and take takeaways from this research. So to start off, uh, let's tell you about a day in, in the life of a pen tester. Uh, I was at the Tunnel Project with my colleague Thijs, uh, working on getting towards working towards getting the domain access within the network. You know, doing my thing. And at some point, uh, we wanted to move around some files within a host and our workstation within the network. So. The easiest way to do this, I thought, was to spin up an SMB server using Impact's implementation. And while doing so, out of nowhere, uh, someone tried to authenticate to me. Uh, the username included something like Palo Alto user ID. And while it was authenticating to me, uh, the Impact SMB server threw some errors uh, referring to an unsupported DC RPC opnum code tool. Uh, and besides that, it wasn't like a one off thing. Uh, the user kept authenticating to me over and over and over. So, you know, Naturally, when this happens, uh, you start to relay the credentials, you know. Uh, luckily for me, when I looked at my Bloodhound data, the user was also a domain admin. So, you know, you raid stuff, you pwn some hosts, get credentials on those, you know, do your thing, and before you know it, the job's done, right? Well, yes, but actually no. Uh, I wanted to figure out what I was actually doing on the hood. So, I started Googling a bit around using the username as a reference, and I figured out this was a feature that allowed firewalls to probe clients on the network and gather information about locked on users. So I verified this with the client, uh, if they indeed use the feature and they told me yes, we do, uh, we use it to apply security policies in the network. Googling around a bit more, uh, I figured out most of the articles that describe this feature from offensive side of things uh, mostly talked about uh, that it's SMB based and that it, that it authenticates you. Uh, they didn't look at it any further, you know, how would we potentially return information, for example. So I started to look into it a bit more. First off, I started to look at a, the packet capture of when it, the, the, the process authenticated to me. What I saw is that the client that probing me was connected to the IPC share. Uh, from there, it requested a file called WSVC file. And then it executed a function called the NetWSTA username function, uh, which at the time I presumed was a request to collect information from users. To fully understand what actually what's going on here, I'm going to take a step back and talk about how name pipes are implemented within Windows. So on Windows, there are these three uh, default administrative shares. Uh, there's a C$ dollar share. Uh, this share basically gives rights to the entire disk. And depending on how many disks you have in your system, you would have multiple of these shares uh, corresponding with the D drive letter associated with the drive. Uh, besides that, there's also the admin share. Uh, the admin share basically gives access to where the Windows folder is, is located within the installation disk. And besides that, there's also the, uh, a special share called the IPC share. Uh, IPC stands for Inter-Process Communication. Uh, the share itself does not give access to files, but it actually gives access to processes running on the system. It gives access to these processes by exposing them through name pipes. So let's look at an example here. Uh, here we have uh, Bob, uh, Bob the name pipe, and it's giving access to the build of the exe uh, by exposing it on the IPC share. This means if you want to read and write data to the build of the DXE, you would do this by talking to Bob. You can also ask Bob to execute specific functions on the build of the DXE. Uh, executing functions this way is often referred to uh, distributed computing environment slash RC remote procedure calls or DCE RPC for short. So we just learned that this process uh, which firewalls do that connect to you uh, on the IPC share and try to collect information about locked on users. Uh, this pretty much is the same thing what I saw on the assessment, uh, and something was authenticated to me and tried to enumerate lockdown users. So, to understand why this process was an instrument to an attack, uh, we're first going to take a step back and look at traditional network segmentation. Uh, we'll cover how this is traditionally implemented, and then why this gets hard and complicated over time. 
Then we'll also show how an interactive solution could help, help with this. I do would like to note that won't be, this won't be a comprehensive guide on VLANs themselves or networking. It will just be enough to get a basic understanding of how VLANs work. So here is an uh, example of a new network, from presumably from a new company. Uh, here everything is connected to the same switch and everything is you now can talk to each other because it's a flat network. Then uh, the company hires a pen tester, it comes along and performs an assessment. Uh, you know, he posts some hosts and presumably when writing a port, he would recommend, uh, among other things, to implement some form of network segmentation. So the client starts to think about this and they uh, get the idea to implement some form of zones. In this example, a blue client zone and a yellow server zone. The idea here is to uh, not allow traffic to flow freely between the zones and restrict it by default. To do this, the client would presumably use VLANs. So, you know, how would these VLANs work? So let's take this four port switch, for example. There's four ports configured with two different colors, blue color and a yellow color. Uh, basically what this does, uh, the blue color represents VLAN ID 2 and the yellow color represents VLAN ID 1. Whenever a device is, co is connected to a blue port, it will uh, only allow traffic to flow to other ports which are also blue. Meaning, if we were to connect four uh, physical devices to the same switch, they will only be able to see and talk to each other with the corresponding color. Configuring ports this way is also referred to on type ports. But you know, a switch doesn't actually use colors, it's a network protocol, so how does it do, how does it do this on the hood? Well, whenever an Ethernet frame passes through a switch port, which is configured with a specific VLAN ID, it will edit this uh, Ethernet frame to include an extra header, the AD1.1Q header, also referring to a VLAN ID header. Which means whenever the Ethernet frame passes through, the corresponding VLAN ID is added to the internet, Ethernet frame. Then the switch will ensure that only uh, traffic with a specific, this specific VLAN ID is able to reach other ports which have this corresponding VLAN ID. Th this is, uh, isn't all the switch you can do though. Uh, the switch can also be co configured using different type of ports called TAC ports. So uh, let's take a, another example with two switches. Here we have the same VLAN ID as the blue one and the yellow one. And let's say we have a device connected to switch one on the blue VLAN and we want it to talk to a device on switch two, also in the blue VLAN. To do this, what we would do is we would configure two ports on its corresponding switch switches as tag ports. What it does is it will allow the traffic from the corresponding VLANs to flow between the switches. But it won't allow the, the blue VLAN to reach the yellow VLAN even though it passes over the same port. Having all these devices segmented from each other is great for security, but not so much for productivity. You can use this device such as a firewall to allow segmented access between these zones. For example, you could tell the firewall to allow clients from the blue zone to reach the servers in the yellow zone using a specific port. This is the very basic concept of network segmentation using VLANs, and it's pretty easy to understand within such a small scale network. But, you know, companies usually don't have one VLAN, they, or, or two, they have multiple, and, you know, after some basic rules that is initially set up, they grow over time, and before you know it, there's a whole bunch of rules, and nobody knows what's going on anymore, everything is on fire, and everybody's screaming. So, you know, this is where the alternative solution comes in. One of these solutions being a Palo Alto user ID, uh, a firewall SSO solution, as you might call it. Uh, basically what it does, uh, Palo, Alto, Palo Alto user ID creates a used to IP mapping, and then this used to IP mapping is able to allow you to see with visibility within the network, you know, which, which user is doing what, and allows you to create firewalls for, for specific users. The Palo Alto user ID can be configured to collect information from multiple sources, for example, Active Directory authentication logs, syslog servers, and the one which we're going to talk about today, client probing. So by using this SSO feature, instead of to rely on traditional ways of segmentation, uh, you could say a specific user in a blue VLAN is allowed to, allowed to access a specific server within a yellow VLAN. Even though there are other users within the blue VLAN, uh, they are not able to access the server in the yellow VLAN because the almighty firewall figures out who is locked on with on a client, and then it's going to dynamically assign a firewall to this specific IP. So after finding out this was a thing, I had two strains of thought. Uh, the sys admin in me was like, you know, this is awesome. Uh, the other <laughs> thought in me was about my hacker, uh, talking in the back of my mind, you know, wait, what? We're going to trust clients to return truthful responses and base our segmentation around that. Seems like a bad idea. So to explain why I thought it was a bad idea, let's lose an analogy to explain my thought process. So in this analogy, I'm staying in a hotel and this hotel has a VIP membership. 
which allows you to buy into it and gain extra privileges within the hotel. You know, being a cheap skater that I am, a uh, Dutch boy, I didn't decide to buy into this VIP system. So you know, naturally the first thing which you, when you do when you arrive at a hotel is visit the bar, right? So when arriving at the bar, I noticed there are two fridges of beer. Uh, one, with, one fridge with beer which I would call less desirable beers, and one fridge with the good ones. The only problem here is that the fridge with the good ones has a, mem has a sign on it which says VIP members only. So even though it says VIP only, I still want one of the good ones. So I walk up to the bartender and ask if, and ask if I can exit the VIP fridge. The bartender is then going to look at his rulebook and he sees that now only VIP members are allowed to access this fridge. Then he's going to look at his user to hotel room system and sees, and sees that he doesn't know who is currently resigning in my room. He's then going to ask me, you know, who are you? So, being any stand-up law by assistant that I am, I would do three responses, this answer and tell him that I'm Justin. The bartender is then going to look at his rulebook again and look at the member of the VIP members and of course, you know, because I'm not on the list, he's going to tell me, no, you're not allowed to ask this fridge. But you know, instead of giving up, I want one of the good beers. I start to look around the room and I see there's a guy over there in the corner named Steve drinking one of the good beers. So I get this genius idea, you know, instead of saying who I am, let's lie about who I actually am. So I walk up to the bartender again, uh, asking to access the fridge, this time using a different hotel room number. The, bar the bartender is then again going to look at his rule book, since it's only VIP members allowed to access the fridge. He then is going to look at his used to hotel room system and see if he doesn't know who's currently residing in his room. So he's going to ask me, you know, who are you? This time, instead of saying I'm Justin, I'm going to lie and tell him that, I'm, that my name is Steve. He's then going to take this information, look at this rule book and see, you know, hey, Steve is a VIP member, of course, you can access the fridge. So, you know, seems like a plausible attack, right? The user identity feature might not uh, expect us to return false information and this would potentially allow us to access things we aren't allowed to. As for figuring out who you want to impersonate, uh, instead of looking at the bar, you would, uh, could look at you know, Active Directory data from using, uh, collected using Bloodhound and figure out there is a specific group of an Active Directory which references AC firewall ACLs. The idea of a text scenario here is basically the same as a app web application might have it. You know, whenever a web application just trusts client input without validating it, you're usually able to break things within the web app. But the thing is, we clearly don't know this for certain. Uh, the user ID system might try to uh, revalidate or correspond uh, the information collected from user probing with other sources such as Active Directory authentication logs. But we can try to figure it out by looking how the solution is supposed to be implemented. So let's start off with what we know for certain, the firewall ACL. Besides traditional VLAN and IP address based filtering, you can also assign an extra source option within this ACL. Uh, this extra source option being either a user or an Active Directory group. In this case, the firewall uh, only allows members of the VIP uh, group to access a specific fridge in within another VLAN. When implementing client probing, uh, you can either use SMB or WMI. Uh, the firewall itself only allows uh, probing on WMI, but there is also an agent which allows for both. Since our uh, presumed attack method uh, relies on SMB, we're going to talk only about the client today. The agent itself needs to be installed somewhere on the system within the network. From this place, it needs to be able to access the sources which is trying to collect data from. So in our test case, we're going to use a very simple network design. Everything here is, co is connected to the same VLAN except, except for the segmented fridge. This of course is not a typical corporate network design, but it will do for our demonstration purposes. The Palo Alto University is then installed somewhere within VLAN 1, since there it's going to be able to access the clients and as well as the access directory domain controller. Even though it's called the user ID agent, uh, it's not installed on, a, on every host within the network. Uh, it needs to be installed on a host, which is then able to connect to different sources. You can, however, use multiple agents if you want to, but doing that depends on your network design and the limitations of the, of the software. Now that we understand our network design, let's look at how you would install the agent. When installing the uh, Palo Alto user the agent software, uh, you're prompted to use a service account if we were to enable a flat standard X directory user uh, as the service account, it would arrow out because the uh, minimal needed rights are already logged on as a service user rights assignment. Then, depending on the collective method you want to use, you would then add additional rights to this account. 
when reading the vendor documentation, uh, they actually pro properly explain how to implement the least privileges, except they sadly don't do for SMB-based pro client programming. Meaning that you know when this stuff is implemented, you and, uh, you and I both know that this is usually overprivileged with either local admin or in the cases that I saw, even domain admin privileges. In the cases that you're using SMB-based probing, the overall security does, does heavily depends on all the factors within the network. For example, a network access control or a general system hardening that would prevent SMB relaying. And you know, Paul Alto even knows this. Uh, with a multiple places within the documentation where it references client probing, they advise you to not use this. Anyhow, after having set up the appropriate rights for the user, you can start to configure the agent. Uh, when doing so, you would uh, very easily figure out that you don't need to do much. Uh, both the server, server collection method and client probing is enabled by default on both WMI and SMB. You know, and I think this is important one to note because you know, Palo Alto by default recommends against doing this, but it's enabled by default within the agent. So if an administrator wants to use the same defaults, he might unknowingly implement a system that is going to spray hashes everywhere in the network. Now the only thing that you need to do before the client to start you know, collecting sources from a server or start programming clients is to add a network server source, in this example a domain controller. This is all that is required to start to make the agent start probing and collecting resources, but it has another function I would like to cover called caching. So whenever the agent identifies a user to IP match, it will not only forward this information to firewall, but also store this locally for a specific amount of time. By default, this time is 45 minutes. Uh, however, this uh, caching timeout does not correlate to the probing interval, uh, meaning even if the uh, collected information was done by probing, and it's been cached for 45 minutes, the system will still prep the client regardless of this caching timeout. Now that we've taken off con the configuration of the client itself, we can look at the firewall. So the first thing you would do is just simply add the agent to the firewall. This will enable the firewall to talk to the agent whenever a specific ACL triggers the a event to collect the information from the user. Then what you would do is you would enable user identification ACLs on the zone where you would want to configure these. Uh, then to allow the firewall to know about users in your server and in your environment, you would add a, a LR profile. This LR profile is basically going to link you know, the resources from Active Directory to the firewall. Then from this point onward, you're able to create firewall rules uh, using users as a source. But if you want, want to also use groups, you need to do an additional step. This step being a group mapping. Basically what this does is going to take the groups within your Active Directory environment and catches members on the firewall itself, so it doesn't need to perform an LLP query every time you know, a user matches an ACL. Then, from this point forward, uh, whenever you create an, an ACL on the firewall and generate some traffic matching this rule, uh, the firewall will send over a request to the agent, uh, asking you know, who is logged on, and if it doesn't, the agent doesn't know, it will start probing us. In this example, we can see an Ubuntu client performing a ping towards the fridge, and you can see the agent starts probing us. So, as we now know, uh, instead of three, three components, there are actually four components in this flow. Uh, there's the client in VLAN 1, there's the user ID agent, the firewall, and the fridge, which we want to access. So, regardless of what we do, the agent is going to collect information from the access directory and store this information to build out its user to IP mapping cache. Then we come along and ask the firewall to access the specific fridge in a segmented VLAN. The firewall is then going to block our traffic and tell us, you know, hold up, I need to know who you are because, you know, there's a user ACL mapping. The firewall is then going to send over this information request to the agent. The agent is then going to look at its cache to see if he knows who we currently are. And because he doesn't know, he's going to send over a probing request to us asking, who are you? The only issue being right now is that we currently don't support this. So whenever a request comes in, we throw an error like, lol what, unsupported DCE RPC. So at this point, I thought, you know, maybe if I implement NetWQ as a user room, nobody will be able to tell I'm Spider-Man. But before going off building something, I would first like to know what is actually happening on the hood. So we're going to look at some Microsoft documentation and, you know, figure it out from there. So again, if you look at a packet capture, we would see that the probing request tried to access a name pipe called WSSVC. With a bit of Googling around, you could easily figure out that it's actually called the Workstation uh, Service Remote Protocol. And luckily for us, uh, Microsoft has this huge handy PDF which fully explains everything within this name pipe. So when I actually wanted to build something around this, I was kind of looking up against you know, building this from scratch. Uh, so after asking around internally on our MetaMost, uh, 
how it was redirected back to uh, an in packet, which in hindsight was actually you know pretty obvious because the, ref the readme references you know the specific name pipe we want to implement. When it came down to actually implementing the net WS a username function, uh, most of them most of the work was already done for me. Uh, all the structs uh, for the function to properly uh, function were already implemented in a packet as Python classes. Here on the left, you can see a simplified version of the request as Microsoft describes it, and on the right, you can see the class within the end package solution. So all I have to do is just figure out, you know, how I would implement some code, which is going to trigger and return information information how I wanted to. But before I start extending end packet, I want an easy way to verify what my code was doing. So, but if you're googling, I found this function called net locked on, uh, which is pause function written by Harmjor. Uh, this function basically uh, does the same thing as the firewall would do. So this allows us to start test our code without having have to rely on a firewall. With the firewall temporary out of the way, I could start implementing things with a packet. Uh, I won't bore you with every single line of code that I added, but I would like to share a couple of things that I found out which might be handy if you ever want to implement something similar. So the first thing uh, is whenever uh, currently whenever a packet receives a probing request, it has no idea how to handle this. So in order for a packet to support this, what we would do is we would edit a dictionary within the class, which is basically going to link this opnum code to a method which we would define later. This way, whenever a packet receives a specific opnum code, it knows which method should handle this request. The next one is that it shouldn't add arguments on the SAP server class itself, if you want to supply it with CLI argument information. Uh, to supply this information to the method that you're going to use, is you would uh, define a function which is going to update a configuration file. After doing this, within the class itself, you can use a dictionary to get this information back you initially supplied on the CLI arguments. As you can see here, the values that are initially added as CLI arguments uh, are here used to return the actual information upon a request. So let's actually look this in action. Uh, here on the top, we can see a PowerShell session with the get locked on user function loaded. And on the bottom, we can see a Ubuntu client with our uh, modified M version of mpacket. Whenever we send off a get and logon request to the Ubuntu client, you can see the information which we supplied on the SMB server is now returned to the request, meaning that we're currently able to fully respond to these re programming requests. So the issue being that we currently didn't support it is now gone, so we return the spoof user information. The agent is then going to take this information and enter its cache. And then afterwards, we'll forward this to the firewall. The firewall is then going to uh, use the information and either give us access to the fridge or not, depending on the information we supply. You know, which is great, everything is in place for this attack. So let's take this and apply it to the real thing. So here you can see a firewall configured with a user ACL. Here it says that only VIP members within VLAN 1, are able to access the fridge in VLAN 2. Then, here on the right, you can see the X directory console with a specific user group. And on the left, you can see an Ubuntu client, which we're going to cover more shortly. If you open the VIP members group, you can see that the user Steve is a member of this group. Then, if you look at the Palo Alto user the agent, here we can see the current user to IP mapping cache. To show you that I'm not cheating, uh, here on the left, we can see that the Ubuntu client has one IP address and that it currently isn't listed within the user to IP mapping cache. Then, if we start to generate some network traffic matching the firewall rule, you would see we're not able to access this specific fridge. Here we can see the agent again, uh, and this has currently received a request from the firewall to gather information about us. Um, the agent doesn't know, so it's adding us to the probing queue. Meaning, if we were to start our own SMB server, which is able to respond to these requests, we can now return our spoofed user information. So after starting the agent, uh, we just have to wait a while for it to stop probing us. And what it eventually does, 
you can see that we just returned domain slash Steve as our locked on user. You can see that then that this information is added to the user bmapping cache. And on the bottom left, you can see our ping currently being allowed to access the fridge. So if we switch over to our browser again, here we can see all the barriers we want to access. You know, great sex, we just succeeded in bypassing a firewall ACL. So if you want to play around with this stuff, the goes on GitHub. You know, the QR codes on screen, so scan it and have fun. Um, so now, after just spawning one of the firewall vendors, I started looking around a bit more because, you know, it might be, might be more out there. Uh, so after Googling around, I did figure out that most firewall vendors have some form of user to IP mapping function but not all of them use SMB as, in, as their probing method. Though, I did find one uh, called SonicWall, and they referenced something called NetAPI. So after looking into it, you know, NetAPI is SonicWall as a SO solution, and it's basically much the same as Palo Alto user ID. It can be configured on an agent, which is installed somewhere in the network, you know, and it starts collecting information from Active Directory or, you know, client probing. The only main difference being is that the documentation of Sonic Wall is mostly scattered all around. Uh, depending on what, if, what documentation you happen to be opening, you're either told to use leash privileges or you're told to just use administrative rights. Apart from that, there's much else going on, so we can just right, jump right into the demo. Here we can see the Sonic Wall SSO agent being configured to start probing clients using NetAPI. And if we switch over to firewall, we can see that currently there's a rule which says if we want to access Google, we need to be a specific user, in this case being administrator. Then if we start to generate some traffic, you can see we currently aren't allowed to access this resource. If we then look at our SMB implementation, you can see that we supplied the username administrator. And the corresponding domain. And after starting this survey, we just have to wait a while for the agent to start probing us. And when it does, you can now see by returning the correct information, we're able to uh, allow access to this firewall ACL. So I just showed you how to pwn two different vendors using uh, you know, arbitrary spoof user information. But there is this caveat I neglected to mention this far. Uh, and this caveat basically covers you know, how NCB guest access work with an packet in Windows. So whenever an NCB, uh, packet NCB server is started without any form of authentication, uh, whenever authentication fails, uh, it will fall back to an SMB guest access session. Meaning that our probe requests thus far have made use of an SMB session which has guest access enabled. The issue being here, this shouldn't be, be possible by default in the recent version of Microsoft Windows. By default, there should now exist a registry key which will uh, prevent the client from accepting an SMB server session with guest access enabled. But you know, up to this point, we have had any problems with this. So as it turns out, uh, even though Microsoft says this registry key should be exist by default within a specific version of Windows, it currently doesn't exist within the Windows 10 clients. However, it does in Server 2019. Meaning if you were to install, install this agent on a Server 2019 server, uh, this exploit wouldn't work. If it's installed on a Windows 10 client, I would recommend you to check if this registry key ex exists, and if not, enable it. So let's cover the disclosures. Uh, I started my first disclosure with Polo Auto and shared two findings. The SMB hash disclosure and the actual bypassing firewall ACLs. I was then informed that NetBIOS based client probing will be dropped from a further version of Polo Auto user ID. Though at some time I was informed that this issue would not warrant a CVE because this was an issue with the Microsoft protocol itself and not Polo Auto. Uh, then after that, after being told that, I was added to the Hall of Fame. I currently don't know the status of the uh, dropping of NetBIOS. Uh, the latest response of the vendor was that the fix is already present in the product because the client does not need to use this. Then we can cover the disclosure of SonicWall. Uh, I started the disclosure around the same time. And then after some while they informed me that the issue was actually a duplicate. 
Besides that, they uh, told me that they would add a warning whenever the user administrator was used. So in my head, I thought it was kind of a dumb thing, because we're just, we're just going to take this whole if statement, smack it on the issue there, and call it a day. So naturally, I shared my concerns with the vendor, and I asked them, you know, which uh, of my vulnerabilities were a duplicate from the other researcher. After some time, I received an email which informed me that they released the associate CSV number for the issues. So, looking at the disclosure of the vendor, I uh, figured out who the other researcher was, uh, Cedric Luciant. I then sent him a message asking him basically, you know, what did he disclose to Sonic Wall? Then, after talking to him, I figured out that he didn't uh, perform any ACL bypasses, he disclosed the SMB hash disclosure part. Meaning that Sonic Wall just took a boat of our findings, tagged mine onto his, and called it a day. Uh, anyhow, regardless of that, I still wanted to figure out if there were any other fixes they implemented besides the actual if statement, which is going to check the user administrator. So I installed the agent, and you know I did find out a couple of things. The if statement is there. Uh, it only does actually check if the username is called administrator. Uh, it doesn't actually check the effective rights of the user, meaning if you were to create a user and give it domain admin rights, it will not prompt this warning. Besides that, this warning only prompts uh, when you configure the service account in a later stage, not during the initial installation when this is initially set. They also changed the default probing method. Uh, before the disclosures, this was net API. Afterwards, they changed this over to WMI. They also updated the documentation. Uh, they do now reference that you should use a local administrator when you want to use net API based probing. So you know, what's next for this research? Uh, there is potentially a vendor tree. Uh, I expected them to also be vulnerable. Uh, their implementation is slightly different than we talked about today, but I think they're vulnerable, so I already started a disclosure process with them. Uh, besides that, I did notice there were a couple of vendors which uh, used a WinRec name pipe. Uh, this WinRec pipe references the Windows registry, and they basically perform a check within the registry to enumerate the locked on users. Uh, it would require some further research, but I think this is also vulnerable to the same thing which we talked about today. Uh, also, uh, there was a lot of vendors which used WMI to perform the probing requests. Uh, currently, there are no uh, open source implementations of setting up a your own WMI server. So if we're able to implement this within some product or some open source tools, we might be able to break a lot of firewall vendors. Apart from implementing uh, new protocols and that kind of stuff, uh, we might able also be able to abuse the caching function of the agents. You know, let's imagine you have someone working within a corporation, it's about five o'clock to leave for home. Uh, we might be able to reuse his IP, aesthetically assign it to ours, and hopefully the IP address still has a use to IP mapping cache. Other than that, you know, we talked about firewalls today, but there might be other products out there which use a similar technique. You know, the, even though they, I would think they wouldn't use SMB for probing, but WMI, it wouldn't surprise me if they were to support an, uh, an SMB based probing method. You know, I use the same idea we talked about today. You might be able to trick the vendor or product into doing something unexpected by returning arbitrary information. So, the conclusion and takeaways. Uh, now, the first one, why I think client probing is generally a bad idea. Besides the whole password spraying and hash disclosure part of doing a probing based on SMB, I think that generally client probing is a bad idea. You know, regardless of the protocol used, you're never sure that the endpoint you're talking to is returning arbitrary or spoofed information. And you know, basing a logic of a product, for, for example, applying so security rules around that is, in my brain, a bad idea. And as shown today, this can now be exploited by uh, the Embacket implementation I built, but it wouldn't surprise me if you were to kill the existing name pipe within Windows and spin up your own, you would be able to exploit this natively within Windows. Another one, big one being is just because a vendor supports a specific feature, this feature does not mean it's secure or secure by default. In both cases, the vendors we looked at today supported a method which is generally known to be insecure. And in the cases, and in both of the cases, you know, it was enabled by default. You as a person really need to practice your due diligence when it comes to uh, looking at these extra features. You know, you need to look at how to implement it and ask yourself, you know, the what if questions. What if we're able to respond to these requests? You know, is it actually safe and, you know, and a, a smart idea to base our rules around this?
So thanks for listening to me about rambling about firewalls for 45 minutes. If you think I got something wrong, please reach out to me on Twitter. And if you want to play around with stuff yourself, the code is on GitHub. That's all for me. Have a nice day, come.